Welcome to the Deep Dive, Emerald City Hockey's Seattle Kraken podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Deep Dive, Emerald City Hockey Seattle Kraken podcast. This is, uh, is going to be a tough one, RJ. Tough conversations have to be had after that loss to the Avalanche last night. I mean, we're going to be talking, you know, from the front office and, and anything that they might do or, or, you know, could be on the table now. Certainly the coaching staff and Dave Haxtall, lots of conversations flying around him and, and that group. We're going to dig into all of that stuff on the deep dive. We've got some pretty breaking news we, we held off the deep dive RJ to a Tuesday and it rewarded us without, you know, we were able to avoid the deep dive curse, or at least we hope we are, with some breaking news from today that we'll get to. But first, RJ, got to thank our sponsor, Queen Anne Beer Hall. And you actually have some pretty exciting news when it comes to the beer hall beyond just me finally being able to get my pretzel next week. I do. That's right. So uh, fun news from the Queen Anne Beer Hall. We can finally share this. So I know there's been a lot of anticipation over a second Queen Anne Beer Hall location, and, and we've known that it's coming. It'll be Moss Bay Hall at the Marina Park in Kirkland. So they're going to have a second location in Kirkland. It's going to be great. But we can share with you the opening date. So it'll be open to the public December 13th. So that is uh, less than a month away as we record this here on November 14th. So I am so excited to check out the new location. I mean, it's going to be a lot of the same Queen Anne Beer Hall stuff that you know and love uh, but with some really fun twists. They're also uh, being uh, in Kirkland at Moss Bay Hall. So if you're on the east side, it's a little bit closer to you, much easier to get to. Uh, go check that out December 13th. Uh, we certainly will. Yeah, definitely excited for it. And uh, congrats to them, too, for, for growing and expanding. I mean, in any business, but especially in that like restaurant bar business, that is that is some tough stuff. So congrats on them for for getting that going. And then uh, before we transition into the news and notes, RJ, just want to remind everybody tomorrow night over on Patreon. Uh, that's patreon.com slash Emerald City Hockey for all of our Terror of the Deep Tier patrons. We are going to have our live game commentary for the rematch against the Oilers. Kraken obviously did not do great against the Oilers this past weekend. Got a chance to make things right in their barn. Going to be watching that tomorrow with all of you. We always have such a fun time. Really looking forward to, to experiencing that with everybody. And then, hey, if you're interested, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see the link in the description below. But that's not the only fun thing we do over at patreon.com slash Emerald City Hockey. Got tons and tons of other fun stuff, including a weekly podcast uh, called The Red Glare, where we talk about everything league-wide. But yes, especially looking forward to this week, where we've got not just that live game commentary tomorrow night, but also your armchair GM stream a little bit later on in the week, too. That's uh, looking forward to it all, RJ. Yeah, it'll be a very interesting armchair GM stream on November 17th uh, for us as we can kind of experiment with maybe some some moves that Ron Francis could make. I wasn't really expecting this uh, when we did last month's armchair GM chat. It seemed like the roster was kind of set in stone there. Uh, but now, as we'll talk about a little bit later in this podcast, maybe there are some moves that need to be made. So uh, we can go over all those in the armchair GM chat. But I'm just so looking forward to uh, watching the next game with all the Terror of the Deep uh, level patrons. It's always a good time. And and look, given the games the Kraken are coming off of, it is going to be interesting no matter what. Definitely. We, we will all go through the experience together. That is the one thing we know about the experience. We will all be there together. Don't know if it'll be good or bad, but we'll be there together. Um, you mentioned uh, we're going to get into that stuff that, you know, maybe the front office can can do make some moves later on but really the the big news and notes for today that i alluded to earlier was already some moves that ron francis made so why don't you fill everybody in on the latest uh breaking stuff from the kraken right so according to the nhl media site so it hasn't been officially announced yet but this is pretty much good always indicator. you know yeah it's a very good indicator uh the kraken have sent uh ryan winterton and shane wright back down to the coachella valley firebirds uh so they're no longer on the kraken roster there and um this is first of all i think it's a good sign for jordan eberly's health he's been working his way back after suffering a, a skate cut and kind of a freak incident in practice last week and uh, he shed the no contact jersey for morning skate yesterday and it seems like he's ramping up and getting ready to go 
I would imagine he will probably be available next game, but we'll we'll see if we can get some confirmation from Dave Haxtell tomorrow morning. Uh, also, Pierre Edward Belmar, who was available for the last game, he will probably draw back into the lineup uh, with those two being sent down to the Firebirds. The Kraken with a 21-man roster now um, instead of the the 23-man limit, so a lot of those guys are going to have to play. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting, but I mean, I, I'm with you, right? This means it's most likely good news on both the Belmar and Jordan Eberle fronts. Um, look, Shane Wright, Ryan Winterton, they were fantastic in what that they what they had to do. It was a very last minute situation. We'll probably, uh, you know, I can talk about it now. I guess uh, being in Coachella Valley the day that they were called up how that news kind of went through the building. I was very much there for it uh, from when it was announced. A few people knew ahead of time because they did, you know, get the call earlier. Uh, but, you know, I, I showed up around 4 o'clock, RJ. Biles Manu at, at 1.58, he said, is when he got the call. <laughs> uh, so I was there pretty much right on, right on there. And um, you could just tell how excited everybody down there was for these two guys to get that opportunity. I think we all knew Shane was going to get one at some point this year. That was certainly very much what everybody with the Firebirds um, was thinking. But for Ryan Winterton to get that call up too, just hearing the other players talk about that, hearing the coaching staff talk about that, hearing the people who just work for the team around it, whether they're, you know what I mean, uh, talk about it. They just were really, really excited for him. And they liked the idea that this Kraken organization rewards players for playing well, right? Those guys yeah. have been playing really, really well. And then because of that, they got the opportunity. When the opportunity was there, they were the ones that were called up. And um, it was it was really, really kind of cool to be there that day as people were finding out the news, as people were talking about it and, and talking about them because it very much brought them to the forefront that evening. And I thought that was really, really fun uh, to be around. But as far as how they played, RJ, you could not have asked for more from these two guys. No, you couldn't have. I mean, they they went in and filled that fourth line role really well. They brought some speed, some energy that the Kraken really haven't seen in the, on the fourth line since Sprong, Donato, Geeky were let go at the end of last season. So uh, they added kind of a different element to, to what the Kraken did, one that I think was kind of more reminiscent of last year rather than how things have gone this year. And um, I think it's something that was sorely needed. And, and look, they were here for two games where the Kraken, it felt like nobody played well. Uh, uh, but they were not part of the problem. And Dave Haxtell even pointed that out, too, after the Oilers game. He said he thought that Wright and Winterton both played good games. And he said it was not on them. Um, but he thought it was good for them to be around you know, where, where the team didn't play well generally. And they had to kind of learn those lessons, do that honest reflection, everything. Felt that was good experience for them. But, um, yeah, he did kind of make a point to set them aside as not part of the issue. Yeah, and I think that that's really fair. It was, it was good of him to do that, especially because we talked about this when it came to them being called up when we did the breaking news podcast, the emergency pod last week, RJ, about this call up. And we brought up the idea of, look, if they're just coming in to be injury replacements for a handful of games, then they're just going to do that, right? Like we saw with Shane Wright specifically. He was there to replace Belmar. He was there to be the fourth line center, just, you know, play 10 minutes a night, do the job that a fourth line center needs to do, right? Be responsible defensively, win some faceoffs. And Shane Wright did that. I mean, you could almost argue RJ at times he was maybe doing a better job of that than Belmar has been this year, um, just because he was able to create some offense, or at least his line certainly was. I'm looking at it right now. Uh, you got to really drop that minimum ice time marker down all the way on Money Puck, RJ, <laughs> for the line to qualify. But for the two games that Winterton Wright played with Devin Shore, that's the best line the Kraken have had all year as far as expected goals percentage uh, at 66.7. I mean, they they were really, really something as far as being able to generate some offense. And then especially you just look at the defense Shane Wright was able to bring in. And then he was better on faceoffs than I think anybody thought he would be just given his age. So um, I think Shane Wright really proved himself. I think it's it sets him up for, you know, the future call up should the need arise this season, but I certainly think it lays good, strong groundwork for him next year. Ryan Winterton, though, RJ, he just, he was all over the place. Talk about playing with energy on a team, RJ, that, as we'll get into in a little bit, doesn't always have a lot. Ryan Winterton really brought it. 
Yeah, no hesitation from Ryan Winterton. He was fearless in these games, and especially after playing only seven games as a pro, having that call up. I love that the Kraken were willing to do that, uh, that even though he had, hadn't played a whole lot of games too, even in junior with injuries, that they were willing to call him up because he's he looked like the best guy in Coachella Valley. I think he, he looked like the guy who was ready for the moment. And um, I, we noticed during training camp that he has kind of a, a slight frame. He hasn't fully filled out yet, but you couldn't tell by watching him play. I mean, he would go into those corners, he would battle, and he didn't look like he was lacking for size at all. Uh, and he brought some good skill with the puck as well, made some really good passes uh, in those few games. And um, really impressed by what I saw from Ryan Winterton. I think you know, we, we certainly have not seen the last of him in Seattle. And it was good just having him around too. I got to chat with him a little bit and kind of follow up on, we, you got some very good quotes from Dan Bilesma about the call up and you know how he, he called him. And, and I think Bilesma said something like, it was a great call with him. You know, He's like, holy Christmas, I'm gonna go play in the National Hockey League. <laughs> And so I had to ask Ryan, like, did you actually say Holy Christmas or was that a Dan thing? He's like, no, that's a Dan thing. Um, but, uh, you know, Winterton, fun to talk to, good personality to have in the room, too. Really enjoyed that. Yes, I will say what, what Bilesma did was he, he he was you know referencing the call and he said, you know, Ryan was like, holy sh Christmas. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's such a Dan Bilesma thing. Oh, that's he, great. He very much caught himself uh, almost too late, but he, he did catch himself there. Um, and, and he changed it to Christmas there, which was, I mean, it makes it better, especially given the time of year and everything. Um, you mentioned how he was, you know, yes, he, he's on a little bit of a leaner frame right now. He's still growing and developing in that regard, but that he was able to come in and play physical, go, to, go into corners, win board battles, which was a big deal. And when you watch it, RJ, this is something that you've talked about earlier this season with Yamamoto. It's something we've talked about. I've talked about on the prospect live chats with Jagger Furcus. He really understands how to position his body to protect the puck when he's in the offensive zone and defenders are coming at him or when he is in a board battle, how to leverage himself that even though he might be going up against an NHL defenseman who's 6'2", 6'3", and has, you know, potentially 30 or 40 pounds on him how he can leverage himself to not just right away lose that battle, but then, you know, use his superior kind of stick skills to be able to, to win it or dig it out or protect the puck when he needs to. And I thought that was really impressive and it showed a lot more maturity to his game that doesn't really get focused on by most people, right? Like we're all watching him at Coachella Valley, those of us that really pay attention to the prospects and want to inform everybody about them. That's he's only played six games there. That's not one of the things you're starting to look at six games into somebody's AHL journey. You're you're watching like where where is he lining up on the ice? How is he how is he working with that? Dealing with the increased speed as he moves up a level, maybe some of the physicality just from a standpoint of can he get to the net, so to speak. But watching him at the, at the NHL level and watching him win board battles, and you're just like, how is he doing this? Oh, it's because he really understands how this works and the fundamental principles he's going to need to make it work that I thought was really impressive. And it shows a lot more maturity to somebody's game who, as you said, just hasn't played a lot of hockey the last th three years, really <laughs> just hasn't yeah. played a full season in any of that stretch. So that's, that was really, really impressive to me. Really, really happy for him, really happy for him and Shane going back down to join a red hot firebird squad, RJ too. just real quick. I mean, I was down there. They had won five straight. I think they're just still rolling. I mean, add those back into the lineup and they are, they're going to crush it. Oh, absolutely. Looking forward to seeing what they do down there. Definitely. Definitely. All right. So let's, let's go ahead, RJ. And I mean, we might as well just, just dig right. Well, do you want to talk about the idea of, of Everly coming back and stuff? I mean, we saw Tanev come back, Everly Belmar got to assume we'll just go back to really seeing the lineups that we were seeing prior to those injuries. Yeah, I would think so. I don't think we're going to see. I mean, you never know after these last two games, maybe you do see a bit of a shakeup. But I, I think, look, we know what Jordan Everly brings. He's one of the more predictable players on this roster. Um, it'll be great to get him back, of course, but I, I don't think there's any kind of extra weird element that he'll he'll bring coming back. We know what he does. Yeah, definitely. All right. So digging, let's just transition into the deep dive and let's get into this of what's kind of going wrong with the Kraken right now, what's up with them? We know that their performance, I mean, they had the one good game this past week, RJ, right? Where, you know, you go into Colorado and you win a great game on the last second goal. Um, that that was fantastic. But you look at the rest of the games <laughs> from the last time that we really talked about it, RJ, and that, that goes all the way back to the Arizona game, 
right? Where I felt like the Kraken kind of struggled there. You, you end up losing in a shootout in a game that, you know, you probably should have been able to put the Coyotes away at some point in. Uh, you get that win in Colorado, but then these last two against the Oilers and especially last night against the Avs, RJ, the, the theme of it, and I think what everybody's really struggling with right now with this team is they can't finish games, right? It's one thing to, to have the first period be your best period, but when you completely consistently disappear for period three, that's a massive, massive problem. And it is not something that Kraken fans are used to dealing with is that's you know one of the hallmarks of this team through the first two years was them having 60 minute efforts, even in games they didn't have a chance at coming back in. They were there until that final horn went. And that's not what we're seeing right now. Right. In in the cases of some of the bad games, too, I think it's the reverse, too. The the one yeah. knock I think you could have on the Kraken when they weren't playing well was, OK, they may not show up on time. You might have a disastrous first period, but they are going to fight until the end and they will never give up. And you're kind of seeing the reverse of that. They're usually good for a one, a good first period. And then it just falls off in the second and then extra falls off in the third. And it's, it's become a pattern. And it's something that's absolutely worth talking about, worth worrying about at this point, because we've seen it so often and, and because everyone's aware of it and it continues to happen. Yeah. Uh, I've, I, I mean, I can't remember a period of time, RJ really following any team outside of like, you know, some expansion era clubs in, in the previous expansion rules where you could find a team that could just kind of consistently have fewer than five shots on goal in a period. Like that's, that's a big, big problem that the Kraken are dealing with right now. And I know Hackstall had, um, some some pretty interesting quotes around that around developing a shooter mentality. I don't know if you have those <laughs> ready to go, but he you know they did have a big practice after that Edmonton loss, um, and then we you know we were hoping for some sort of turnaround before the Colorado game, but it doesn't sound like that entirely happened. Well, it obviously did not happen. Uh, there was no yeah. turnaround. But I will kind of hand it over to you because you know this was a very different practice from from Dave Hackstall, and as you were there, I kind of want you to be able to share that. Right. So this is what makes this week feel different than really any other week that we've experienced so far with the Kraken. To me, uh, is that practice that they had the day before the Colorado game, the day after the Edmonton game. So the Kraken come out, they go down for nothing in the first period against Edmonton. It's just, you know, it's a rough game all around. And after that game, we were wondering, okay, are they going to have their scheduled practice tomorrow? Sometimes Hackstall in the past will just cancel those practices, just give the guys a day of rest, kind of, you know, flush it, right? You know, let's just reset mm -hmm. here. Uh, but he didn't go that way. He, he chose to kind of go the opposite way. The Kraken had practice and they had a really intense physical practice. He worked them very hard. Um, this was, it felt like kind of a punishment type practice for the group. And in that practice, we saw something that we have not seen from Hackstall at any point before. This was unlike any practice I've seen. And I've pretty much seen them all since this team started. Um, and so I, the most important moment I think came midway through practice where Hackstall just stopped a drill mid drill and uh, gave some words to his team, and I'll, I'll censor those because this is a family-friendly podcast, but, you know, talk about shooting identity, my ass. No beeping identity. No shooting identity. Shoot the beeping puck. And, you know, it's the kind of thing where the player certainly got the player's attention, certainly got all our attention in the media. I think it was something that maybe the media was kind of meant to hear as well because it was crystal clear. Um <laughs> And I think it it's representative of the frustration that, that Dave Haxall has with his team. And like you mentioned, the low shots on goal totals in that Oilers game, they, I think, managed 18 shots on goal, which is one off the franchise record low. And it, it's part of a larger picture, as Haxtell kind of more calmly pointed out after practice when talking with us. He said, you know, the shots on goal, they help you drive possession when the rest of your game is going. And so it kind of plays in with the, the rest of your game and everything that you do. But clearly there's the frustration there. And, and he really threw down the gauntlet to his team in this one, um, sending a message in that practice in a way that he had just, I, I've never seen him do as, as coach of the Kraken. And that to me communicated how desperate he felt the situation was with where his group was at and importantly where the effort level was at, where you had in games like the Edmonton game and the Calgary game a little while ago, mm -hmm. the effort level being unacceptably low and he, I think, you know, broke glass, hit the button in case of emergency and, and really kind of blew up on the team. 
And I was really interested to see how they would respond. And then, you know, the Colorado game, I think the most telling thing is they had one shot on goal through the entire third period where they were trailing the whole time. And the one shot on goal was like a dump in from their own zone that just happened to roll on net. For me, that's as good as zero shots on goal. And given the specific message, especially, you know, with the profanity there that we were all meant to hear about shooting the puck, that is the the worst outcome I can think of is when Mm -hmm. you're trailing in a game and you essentially get zero shots on goal. Um, The message clearly did not land with the team, did not resonate. And you had the same problems again, where you had a strong first period and then it just tailed off the whole rest of the game. And so I think we're, we're at a level now where we have to be asking harder questions than we ever have before about the coaching and about their ability to reach these players. Yeah, uh, you look at their last five games, RJ, the, the shots on goal totals. You go back to the Calgary game, which kickstarts this stretch, 20 shots on goal. It's pretty low. Uh, against Arizona, 38, which is very high. And, you know, look, that's, that's the second best game they played in the stretch. Even the win in Colorado, RJ, only 22 shots. And then these last two games, 18 and then 19 shots against Colorado at home last night. These are exceptionally low shot totals in today's NHL. Um, I I don't know really many many teams that are supposed to win with shot totals that low, to be perfectly honest. And the Kraken aren't winning. That's that's part of this problem. In that five game stretch, you got one win and you've got one shootout loss. That's three points in five games. Not good. Uh, and I'm with you. Uh, we are seeing it. We saw it last night in the post game live. Seeing it today on Twitter. And really, the big question that that gets thrown around the most right now with Hackstall RJ is just, has he lost the room? And I think this is an interesting one um, because I, it he's never been that kind of fiery coach that 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 seemingly ultra motivator. We've, we talked about this way back in season one, uh, the different coaching styles and kind of where he falls in that much more of a developmental coach rather than, uh, you know, a gruff in your face, you know, cussing up a storm Tortorella type or Bruce Brujo type or whatever you want to call it. Um, but he's much more of a, of a focus on getting better in practice. Let's work through these problems rather than a guy who's going to just you know, maybe lead the charge, so to speak, and, and get everybody fired up in a way. And it right now, more than ever, RJ, the Kraken feel like they need that. They need that really, really bad because when you are consistently losing momentum after starting off games well, and then you just lose it in the second and you can't show up for the third, that comes down to a motivation thing, right? When you can't put on a full 60 minute performance, that's a motivation problem. And we've talked about this in years past, whenever the Kraken have struggled, you know, it doesn't always look like they have a player on the roster capable of getting everybody fired up and getting going. But if the coach that that's where the coach kind of has to step in and, and maybe try to be that guy right now, I don't know who it has to be RJ, but somebody has got to do it. Somebody yeah. needs to, it, it needs to be done. And, it's it's confusing to me because this is a problem we really haven't seen from the Kraken yet, even when times were very bad in, in year one where it was clear this is a bad team. The effort was always there. And, and Hackstall's always taken the approach, at least outwardly to the media, of, you know, things aren't as bad as, as they may look, you know, when when you're down and, and um, you know, basically, I got this. Don't worry, yeah. guys. I, I know you guys in the media like to panic, but I got this. You know, we'll, we'll make sure we have the accountability in this room. And I think he does kind of put a lot of it on the players, which in a lot of situations, the players like that, where the coach isn't necessarily yelling at him, screaming at him, telling him, you got to get going. This is not a, like a Tortorella situation where it's on them to figure things out and, and get things back together. And it works. Well, in the past, it's worked because, I mean, yeah, what, like last season, whenever you had a three game losing streak, you knew that fourth game was going to be a win. They, they would not lose four games in a row. They refused to do it somehow. Um, and so, you know, I think at a point with, with us in the media, we're like, well, yeah, I guess he does have this. He, I, clearly, right? I mean, we, every single time this happens, we were questioning him quite a bit uh, going into the playoffs and questioning where the team was at. They couldn't beat a playoff team. And, hey, they beat the Avs in, a, in an impressive seven-game series. They pushed the Stars to seven games. And I think it kind of builds that level of trust that, okay, he he knows what he's doing. He knows the right buttons to press. And it certainly felt that way. Um, but this, I don't know. I feel like it, it, 
Sorry, Dylan. I'm trying to talk no, myself through this, but like I'm confused also because the Kraken are still two games removed from their best, in my opinion, their best 60 minute effort of the entire season against Colorado. I feel like that, that was only two games ago. I know you look back further than that and you see more bad efforts, you know, in the past beyond that. I mean, Dylan, how much stock do you put into that game? And, and does, you know, does that move the needle for you at all? Less and less every day, right? I, I brought this up uh, after the Oilers game of when it comes to the effort level, that Colorado game doesn't feel like the trend anymore, right? In the past, that was the trend for the Kraken. Th- this season, game like that really feels like an outlier. Right. I mean, I just went through their last five. That is the one that stands out as different. The other four don't line up with it at all. Um, And I think that that's a problem. I think when we start asking, has he lost the room? I think that's a that's an interesting question. It's a kind of a loaded question and it can mean different things to different people. Right. Um, That can mean, okay, the guys aren't motivated to play for him anymore, which I would think is mostly how people mean it. Um, you know, sometimes it can mean, look, they made some sort of change as far as a scheme or, you know, what they're trying to do systematically and it's just not working and the guys are not bought into that. I wouldn't say that that's the case because if anything, the the guys are trying to play too responsibly, right? That's, that's (laughs) something we can kind of keep coming around to. Uh, everybody's on the centers for not really showing up this year, whether it's Maddie, whether it's Wenberg, whether it's Yanni at times. And what we keep saying about them, RJ is like, well, they're, they were actually doing a good job. They're playing the fundamentals really well. They're being defensively responsible. They're actually keeping this from being a lot uglier than it otherwise could be. But yes, they're not exactly selling out to try to go out there and, and get goals. And, um, so I, I don't know that if, if he's lost the room that it would be from like a, you know, his his coaching philosophy standpoint as far as the X's and O's on the ice. It really is just this motivational thing. And I, look, I've only been around for one game. I wasn't even there for a morning skate, right? I, I've only been in front of him for one post game and it was that Arizona game. But it didn't exactly leave me. I mean, that was a game that they should have probably won. Right. That was one where they were kind of they kind of lost it with taking penalties and then the PK not playing well. And I will say, I thought it was a little curious that he wasn't a little bit more, you know, on his team after that. Just just, you know, you don't have to be fiery. You don't have to give the ridiculous quote the way a Tortorella would. But even if just kind of in what you're saying about that kind of being unacceptable or needing to be more disciplined, um, you could you can choose words that would send that message without it being like a media firestorm kind of thing. You know what I mean? But it was very much that Hackstall that you're referencing where it's just, look, we've got this. And it did look like they got it because then they go into uh, Colorado and you look good. But, I mean, right now they look as far from having it uh, as any team can basically get. Yeah, they do. The, the... The media strategy is interesting because I I know he always goes with the kind of I got this type message. And I mean, Dylan, do you think that maybe being a little bit more on his team kind of to us? Because, look, we we saw it in practice. I mean, I think, again, that was meant for us to be heard, um, you know, as that message there, because like this isn't Toronto. This isn't Vancouver. I, right. Knowing this media market, it's not going to kind of blow up on every, you know, into a national story or anything. Um, I, I don't know. Do you think maybe that's a button that he should have, I guess, pressed earlier? If he if he saw these things happening, because even even after the Colorado game, like th- this last game, sorry, we, we just talked to him and, you know, there wasn't a whole lot in terms of, you know, in terms of negative words. It was just a few questions. Joey played great. This game felt very different than the Edmonton game. We started well. Uh, and, yeah. you know, just there it was kind of like that. I mean, do, do you think that 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 helps at all? I mean, now I'm questioning, OK, because with the with the shoot the bleeping puck thing. I mean, that's, you know, that's the, the, the putting the, setting the gauntlet down for yeah. your team, right. To the, to the media. And that didn't work. So I'm just, I'm wondering where even is the, is the solution here? It, it's a tough one. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, you know, I, it sounds like that was maybe the fire that I was maybe missing or wanting to see after the Arizona game. It sounds like that was in this practice, right? That was in him challenging them after the, the Oilers loss. We talked about it yesterday, right? If, if, if yelling at the guys doesn't get them going, what else can a coach do in a situation like this? 
right? You've, you've put the onus on them and the players haven't really responded. So he got, you know, upset with them and, and, and kind of put them on blast in a, in a semi-public fashion in that practice. And they didn't respond to it. So what can you do? And this is where, you know, look, we're not, we're not as, even as the media flies on the wall in all situations, we don't know what's said. We don't know what was said, say, you know, during that practice where then Everly gets you know, the skate cut and they need to call up guys and you're going into that Colorado game. It's starting to look like I said, that was an outlier. Maybe that was just because all of that stuff happened. The guys were playing a little looser for that game. And then you get that performance and then look, you're right back at home. There's the pressures of winning at home. The, the not so secret worry about the season ticket holders, which is also something we're even hearing about in our post game lives now. And, and things kind of change. Um, but it's it's one of those what what can a coach do in this situation? You know, I, I brought up stuff. If if you're normally a coach that doesn't talk to the team during the intermissions, which is normal in hockey for some reason, I still don't always understand why. If I was a coach, I'd want to be talking to them during intermission. All the guys are sucking wind trying to get you know their energy back and and catch their breath during those intermissions anyway. That it's the perfect time just to communicate to them. Um, if you're not a coach who does that, go in and start talking to them. Start working on stuff. Give give them an easy win, right? Find one thing. Have your assistant coaches, your video coach, somebody give you something that you can walk into that locker room with after the first period and say, hey, look, this guy is doing this or they're, they're trying to zone entry here. Let's be a little bit more aggressive there. See if we can stop them there. Or look, they're getting to our net too easy, right? Body them up a little bit more. Try to push them to the outside and, the, and to the sides rather than being able to screen our goaltender. Give them something that they can actually like latch onto as a, as a way of going out there, focusing on something that's going to keep them more engaged into the game and help with the energy level. And then especially if it's like kind of an easy win approach, you're going to build that confidence. You're going to give them that that juice, that that little pick-me-up of, hey, this was a, something that bothered us the last period. I just took care of it, and now I'm feeling like I'm on top of the world. I'm doing my job as a professional athlete, and I'm doing it well, right? I just did the thing that I couldn't do the last period. I'm doing it now. There's no that's that's Athletes feed off of that stuff, and so I do think that that's, a, that's an approach that Hackstall could take uh, if they're not already doing it. So there's there's tiny things like that that you can do. But overall, I mean, it, if it's shooting the puck and these guys don't want to shoot the puck, which is something we've talked about with a couple of the players on this team, uh, that that is a little bit harder because that should be the easy win, right? Go out there and get me 12 shots on goal this period. That should be something that a team could go out there and do and then feel confident like, hey, we did it. That's the that's the easy thing. That's easier than anything else. Uh, and they and they seemingly can't do it. So I I'm I'm with you up. I'm struggling. I don't know. Yeah. On the on the shots issue too, I, I think the last two games, you know, with the emphasis on, on getting more shots, it's not even a, a shot selection problem. I think it's not even that it, they, that no, is a, part of it yeah. that they're passing up opportunities. But you look at the whole body of work, and they're just not putting in the work that's necessary to get those shots. Um, they're not getting into the zone. You look at the Edmonton game, and I think this is one thing Hackstall pointed out and was unhappy with. He said we had zero speed through the neutral zone. None whatsoever. We just had no speed. We couldn't get, develop those chances because we weren't coming at them with speed. And you can't get shots if you're not coming through the neutral zone with speed. They're just going to stop you. You're not going to get into the offensive zone. And yeah, a, a shot that's not in the offensive zone doesn't count for anything. I mean, that's there's no point in that, really. You can't just yes. shoot it from your own zone. Um, so I, I think they're just not even putting in the requisite work to get those looks. Uh, it's, it's not just a, you know, we don't feel like shooting. We're going to be pass first type of thing. It's a, a an effort problem at a fundamental level, I think. Yeah, I, it, there's certainly something to that. I'm going right now. I'm on Money Puck. I'm trying to look at the the shot like heat maps for where where this team is getting shots on goal for these two games. And for the Edmonton and Colorado game, if you look at it, um, obviously they're they're big chances as far as an expected goal standpoint. All all are in and around the net. Which is good. That's what you want. Those are the high percentage chances uh, that you want to be working towards. I'm wondering if the Kraken are too focused on that. And then you look at their perimeter shots, and especially in the Colorado game last night, they are all very much just in the center, right? Nobody's throwing stuff from the point closer to the boards. Nobody's throwing stuff from the face-off dots on either side. This is a team that is that is only shooting if they are in a higher percentage spot to shoot from, which... 
that's fine if you're going to have a high shooting percentage. This team doesn't right now, right? You're in the bottom five when it comes to that. Uh, you just need to be throwing stuff on goal and try to win this with a volume approach if you're not going to have that scoring touch, which they don't have right now. So I almost wonder, RJ, it's, it's like you said, it's an effort problem in some respects. It's also a maybe trying to do too much problem right? They're, they're waiting until they are in a, you know, quote unquote, perfect time, or they're in that spot where they're, Hey, this is the higher percentage chance, but how many times trying to get to that spot with the higher percentage chance, do you lose the puck? Do you get bodied up? Does it get poke checked away? There's a lot of bad goalies in this league, RJ, especially when you're playing teams like the Oilers, throwing shots on net from anywhere. Isn't necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't have to be. I mean, this last game is a perfect example. Look at Georgiev in this last game, the yeah. rebounds that he was giving up. He was really struggling to hang on to the puck. And I think this is kind of what Haxtell was getting at with the comment that I mentioned earlier. When after that practice where he had the, the famous quote about shooting the puck, um, he said, shooting the puck helps drive possession when the other elements of your game are going. When you're chasing those rebounds, when you're trying to get those recoveries, it all adds up together and really helps your possession game. Uh, and I think that's part of what he was talking about is those rebounds that come out, even if you shoot, not necessarily to score, but to go generate another puck that has a chaotic element to it because you don't know exactly where it's going to bounce. If you are the hungrier team, if you're first on those pucks, that can be really valuable for you. And, and I think we're seeing... The Kraken are lacking in that area as well. But, you know, if you do have that going, it's an easy way of, of making it so that if you bring the work ethic, if you're just yep. skating hard and you're just moving fast and you're willing to battle for pucks, then you're going to have some victories there and you're going to generate some good chances just by being opportunistic. Right. But haven't we seen that from them? Right. Like how many, especially like when we were talking about Maddie Beniers this year, how many two on ones? Two on O's. How many opportunities does this team have? We saw it yesterday with, with Brandon Tanev a couple times, right? How This team is actually, like, they can do that. They can get the speed. They can attack and transition. They can get those prime opportunities. And then you look, I, I mean, I think back to the first goal, the opening goal in the Arizona game. There was four passes back and forth between Yanni Gordon and Ellie Tolvanen, and they were on a two <laughs> on O, right? At some point. The players just have to have the mentality of, you know what? No, I'm just going to shoot this puck. Sorry. Like, I'm not going to make this pass. I'm just going to take the shot because the worst case scenario is we make the pass and it gets blocked and there is no shot attempt. Or, you know, you, you make one too many passes and the other guy's not able to handle it and you miss the shot attempt. Right. And so, so few times do we see a player just really walk in and try to pick a spot. There was two examples of that yesterday. I will give credit where credit's due. One was with Brandon Tanev and he hit the post in the first period. Another one was later on with Oliver Bjorkstrand. He missed the net. He probably should have gone blocker side. He tried to go high glove. He had the high blocker side there if he wanted it. Um, so there, there are, are some of those opportunities, but it has been numerous times, RJ, throughout the season where we have talked about them making that one extra pass or the defenseman's already on his belly. Why are you trying to then make a pass across to your line mate, Maddie? And uh, that's a <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> Yeah, it is. And I, man, if only Tanev had scored on that one where he hits the post there, I think the message that sends the team about just shooting the puck, just rip it. Um, mm -hmm. and I know he scores one later in the game, but still, I, I think that's the right mentality to have. And I wonder if maybe that's because he had kind of been away from the team for a bit, not playing games with this team and not getting kind of trapped in the whole mindset because he got injured so early in the season. He really wasn't a part of uh, the recent struggles and everything and, and the lack of shooting. And I think you saw a different mindset from Brandon Tanev in this last game in his return you know that might be just turbo being turbo and then he's you know 110 percent all the time and he's gonna rip this puck and shoot because he wants to score but I think it might also be the fact that he he hasn't experienced a lot of the downside of these recent games with this team and he's eager to go out there and just play the game that he knows he can play so you know I think it's probably a little bit of both um, but still, it's, you know, maybe not the best sign for where the team is at right now. Can we can we talk about Maddie Beniers for a second, too? Because yeah. this is a little bit of an aside, but I, I had a question for you here because um, we talked a couple episodes ago about, you know, his struggles and and you know, wanting to be optimistic about it too, uh, because he's generating the offense. He's, you know, he's doing yeah. a lot of the good underlying things, but there's one issue that, that kind of keeps coming up and I didn't want to raise the alarm bells on it back then. Cause I want to give him some more time, but I'm curious what you think about it, especially with your scouting background. 
the physical battles Mm -hmm. with him that I think he just kind of keeps consistently losing. And it, I don't even think this is an effort thing. I I really think, you know, if you know, Matty Beneers, you know, he's, he's never short on effort of this. It's just, it's, I think it's a size and strength thing. And I've just seen it enough times now, especially in the Colorado game where he's just knocked off the puck in an important moment in a way that he wasn't last season. That's what's confusing to me too, is that it felt like he was winning those battles last year. Um, like, are you noticing that? Do you see it? How concerned are you about it? Because that's one thing that really stood out to me. And I know it's not really part of this this larger theme we're talking about, but if we could just take a couple minutes, I'm curious what you think. I yeah, well, I was trying to look up his size and everything, RJ. Uh, on the Kraken website, he's listed at 6'2". That's generous. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah. that's pretty generous, having stood next to him. Because uh, I was trying to see kind of what he's what he's listed at right now, especially compared to Shane Wright, because uh, I do think that you know Shane Wright is is maybe more of that physical build for for situations like some of that. I will say this: I think I don't think it's an effort issue entirely. I think there are elements of it because I'm with you, right? This wasn't an issue last year. Why is it a problem this year? Generally, as you get bigger year to year in the NHL, RJ, you don't get, you know, less strong. Like, that's not generally what it is. So it would speak more towards an effort issue. But I would say that I just think he's thinking about too much. He's overthinking everything right now. That's that's very much what it sounds like, what it looks like um, when I watch him. He's he's thinking about in those two on one situations, right? You start wondering, does he trust himself to shoot? in some of those when he makes when he goes through the effort to try to pass over a laid down defenseman instead of just taking the shot you start wondering about things like that given the struggles he's had offensively my guess is he's just in his head too much and he's trying to think of what can i do with this puck rather than focusing on just winning the puck battle and i think that's Hmm. where he's probably getting himself into trouble is just you know you're, you're trying to think ahead too much you're not paying attention and and the bottom line is when you are in a situation like this we just talked about it with ryan winterton you need to really understand and think about especially if you are going to be the smaller guy in that battle how to win it right you've got to think about how exactly where your body needs to be you need to be reacting to what they're doing with their body so that you're really always staying on top of it i'm sure if you 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 talk to yamamoto about this it it would be a very much like a, a it's a constant thing of little adjustments to make sure you're keeping your leverage you're staying lower than them you're staying strong on your skates you know when to dig in when you can take that extra step forward to start pushing back against them it's a very calculated maneuver and my guess is right now as with a seemingly a lot of the rest of his game that has kind of taken a step back this year i'm wondering if he's just thinking about too many different things all at once and he's not able to just kind of zero in on what he's doing in the moment gain confidence that way and then kind of move forward interesting i hadn't thought about that side of it to me i mean it just looks like he's getting out muscled but i think you know, I, there might be that element. Too. This is why I ask you these questions. I always, you know, so usually surprised by the answer, but uh, yeah, it makes me think. Well, again, if, if Yamamoto is not going to get out muscled, then nobody then like, right. If he can hold his own yeah. against guys that weigh 50, 60 pounds more than him, then, then anybody can, if you know what you're doing. And Maddie seemingly knew what he was doing at Michigan and last year with the Kraken along the way. Certainly, I think back to his world junior performance or his Olympic performances. He absolutely knew what he was doing. And so I think this year, it's again, it's not that he got smaller. It's not that he got worse at hockey. I just think he's overthinking things too much, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, All right, just to kind of wrap up the Hackstall conversation, RJ, just because it is being talked about and it's I feel like it's being talked about enough that we have to address it. It's the idea of them maybe moving on from Hackstall or, or bringing in a different coach. I will say this, as far as if you were to do some sort of mid-season thing, the time would be now while it's still early enough in the season. I don't know that you would want to wait and, and do it later if you were committed to making a change like that. I just don't think the Kraken are committed to making a change like that. And I, I know you don't either. Yeah, no, it, it's not going to happen. Dave Hackstall's job is secure, at least through the end of this season. They just extended him this past off season. I think you know, anyone thinking in those terms of, of you know, that Hackstall is seat is, is warming up or is warm. I think that's just false. I, I think they're going to at least let him ride out the rest of the season, see how it goes. And yeah, it's got to have to get a lot, lot worse before that conversation even really starts. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is the nuclear option in in a situation like this. You saw what it took from Edmonton, 
to make that call, right? For a team that had higher aspirations, arguably, than even the Kraken this year, as far as them really needing to win and that ultimately having, you know, forcing their hand. Um, but they were, I mean, they're still, their record's significantly worse than what the Kraken are at right now, so. Yeah, and as and as much as we have talked about, you know, the, the negatives of how the Kraken are playing, and yes, it is bad. If you watch some of those Oilers games, you know, from earlier this season, that's what re- truly losing the room looks like when you have yes. that kind of defense, that kind of play. I, you know, I know they look good against the Kraken, but you look at any of their other games this season, uh, you know, that's what it really looks like. Look, there are absolute signs, right? And one of those signs is when your ro- normally robotic superstar and Connor Big. McDavid is losing his head every single game and screaming at anyone and everyone, whether it's his team, the other team, or the officials. That's a sign that there's significant frustrations and stressors going on in the in the room, and and we're not really seeing that from the crack. And we see it from Vince Dunn, but that's Vince Dunn. He's yeah. always done that. Uh, yeah, if you see that from Matty Maddie Maddie Beniers, you start yes. seeing Matty Beniers every game just losing it in frustration, looking like Vince Dunn has the last few games. Then you know there's a real problem. The coach has lost the room, and you got to let him go. Exactly. We're not seeing that from the from the other people. So that's that's the situation there. Um, so if 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 you know, that's the situation on the coaching side of things, RJ, for for the team. Um, there is another way of handling this, right? It's not like, oh, you can only move on from a coach or make a change there. The other thing would be, look, do, do they need to make a trade or something to shake up the room, shake up the core a little bit, um, wake guys up? And that's something that would fall on Ron Francis to do. And this is, I think, potentially a more interesting question just because what would that even look like? Uh, we saw the struggle. We've seen the struggles from the defense. I know we talked a lot about the offense not shooting enough, all that kind of stuff earlier. Um, we also saw some rough play from the defense these last this last stretch as well, especially last night in Colorado, where you have just defensemen watching guys pick apart poor Joey Decord, uh, just really you know hanging out at the side of the net and just not doing much. Um, do you, I mean, first off, we, we brought up the idea of maybe you need to start shuffling the D pairs around a little bit, see if that sparks something. But the other option is, does Ron make it need to make a move in general, RJ, or maybe on D or anywhere? I mean, where are you at as far as the, the Kraken maybe needing to bring in some new voices or send somebody out just to wake everybody up? I'd still give it a couple games before making a move like that. I, I do think that you should probably at least change up the D pairs as something as an idea first, uh, you know, before, especially because if you're making a move, the guys that are out there, it seems like according to the trade rumors, you know, the big ones like Nikita Zadorov, maybe a Chris Tanev, you know, those are defensemen and that's maybe where you're going to add. I would at least try a different look with the D pairs first and see where that gets you. But I get three more, two, three more games of this. I'm completely on board that Ron Francis needs to make some kind of a move, even as just a a signal to the guys like, look, wake up, you know, trades can be made. You could be shipped out here. You know, we could bring in someone to replace you or take your job if you're not playing well enough. So I I think in the medium term, I'm not against it. And, you know, you never want to make a move out of panic either because the other team sees that as well. And, you know, you you might give up more in terms of price than you want to. Um, But I I think it has to be an option they're looking at if this goes on for a few more games. I Just the kind of person I am, I'm still like a little cautious on this stuff. And I know everyone wants to kind of rush to, you know, change needs to be made here, a big change i still want to see something maybe you know two or three more times before i'm absolutely sure uh, that this is what you need to do especially because as i step back into gm mode and i get back into Mm -hmm. you know kind of ron francis brain this blue line was built very specifically for the next two seasons and there was a plan here and what do you what do you do if you bring in like a Zadorov or a Chris Tanev? You know, what does that mean for a Brian Dumoulin? What does that mean for uh, potentially a Riker Evans maybe coming up? What does that mean, uh, you know, for, for Justin Schultz's spot as his contract is up at the end of the year? There's a whole lot of moving parts that I feel like Ron Francis didn't really anticipate having to move around um, if you are to make a deal for a defenseman. Forward, I think it gets a little bit easier. But I, I don't know. What do you think, Dylan? Are you are you on like make a trade now in the next few days? Is this something you'd want to see maybe in a week if it doesn't get better? And and what kind of move would you be looking to make if so? I I mean, look, we are we are dangerously close to you know I know your favorite kind of deadline, which is Thanksgiving, and and what that means for a team. Uh, you could give it another couple games, but like I said, you know, you look at this month of November as a whole, RJ, and it is not good. And you've got to. 
here's here's the thing that most that worries me the most okay because you look at the kraken in the standings and you're like all right they're all they're, they're really not that far out of a playoff spot but then you look and they've played th you know two more games than anybody everybody else right you look at the fact that they've got back to back they've still got three games left this week right and then you got three next week like their schedule is so front loaded that it's I don't know that you that you can be as patient as maybe another team just because you don't want to find yourself. Yeah, we're only a couple points out of a playoff spot, but you know all these other teams have three games in hand on us, right? That's that's kind of a really bad situation. So I think you do have to take that you know into into the picture. You got to take that into your your context of what decision you're going to be making. And when I look at, say, uh, Chris Tanev or Nikita Zadorov, and by the way, we're saying these names because Calgary is the most obvious seller right now. I don't yeah. know that Calgary would love to send these guys in division. That's something else that would have to be, you know, dealt with and figured out. Um, but when you look at guys like that who are on expiring deals, RJ, if you're just trying to salvage this season, I don't know that that's that's the worst thing in the world. And I don't know that that blows up your long-term plan, right? Your long-term plan really on the blue line is still just about getting Riker Evans in there, which Schultz's contract expiring does anyway for you. So I, I don't know that it totally messes with that. I, there's nothing about, uh, you know, the Dumoulin situation is a little more complicated, but there's nothing about say Will Borgen that you couldn't flip in the off season if you needed to or, or move on from him in a way with only one year left on his deal, right? Somebody else would give him a, ch a chance to see, hey, maybe he's a, he sparks it here kind of thing. Um, so I, I don't know that it's that big a deal. I think what's more worrisome is the fact that they're not, you know, they're not finishing. They're not getting shots right now. So I think really a move would have to be, and, I, and the message sending move would be up front. And there, I just really don't know what you would do. Right. Like, yeah, I, I don't know what forward is available that is even going to help you kind of fix this at all. I, I, I don't know what, what other teams to look at. I guess there's San Jose, you know, you can look, I mean, they've, they've got Anthony Duclair, you know, yep. maybe that's someone you could bring in on an expiring deal. I don't think they want to move him quite yet. I think they probably want to wait till the trade deadline, see all the interest that they have. You'd probably have to knock their socks off with a big offer. And, and that probably means, draft picks or prospects overpaying with draft picks or prospects right now because they know you're desperate because that's the thing the sharks aren't mm -hmm. desperate to make a move right now <laughs> i mean if you really wanted to, to swing for the fences uh, you know you, there's potentially a tomash hurdle of you know available i may if the sharks would be willing to move on from him i know they just signed to a big extension but that's like a big long-term commitment that's like your big ad for next year and i don't know how you fit him under the cap this year you probably have to send like wenberg back the other way and drieger and all that stuff it's too complicated to deal to make right now i don't know i mean is there anyone that you're as you as you kind of scan around these teams no. that that might be sellers they, um no, I, it's kevin lebank isn't the answer i can tell you that from yeah. watching him up in san jose like no definitely not anyone there isn't really and that's that's part of the problem look if you're dealing a deal if you're doing a deal as the kraken right now it's it's more so about sending somebody out and sending that message than it is really about who you're bringing in to some extent Right. Like that's yeah. what we've been talking about is somehow, some way this team on paper should be, be at the very least, they should be able to get shots in the third period. OK, like maybe it's not the world a world beating super offensive team. But again, I will come back around to you got, you know, win healthy six guys making five million dollars or more who have all been 20 to 25 plus goal scorers. Right. That that's the expectation for this group and they are not meeting it and that's more of the problem than say roster construction which i've i've been seeing that a lot on twitter too everybody's referencing the strong starts to the season of of daniel sprong and ryan donato and why did we get rid of them and you know our fourth line was such a strength last year all that kind of stuff and i will continue to say look your fourth line should not be the scoring line for your team. That's yes, it saved you last year, but that's kind of more indicative of an underlying problem elsewhere that your other guys are not scoring. And two, you, you know, you were getting Berkey back. You, you had Ty Cartier that everybody wanted in the lineup. That roster spot had to come from somewhere. If you want Ty in the lineup, he's, he's got to be in for somebody else. Um, and also Donato and Sprong would not be putting up the numbers they're putting up elsewhere playing on these teams. I mean, Ryan Donato is getting top line minutes 
on a line that is completely geared to have every advantage possible so that Connor Bedard can put up as many numbers as possible. So it's you have to look at it in context. Sprong and, and Donato would not be performing this way on the fourth line getting 10 minutes a night in Seattle. It just They just wouldn't. Um, but it is, it is one of those things, RJ, where I, I think at the end of the day, you just have to kind of look at the core and just say it's not working. Right on paper, it it should work, but it's not working, and it's kind of not working for the second year in a row, where you expect more from these guys scoring. Well, question for you then, Dylan, because I, I agree with you that it might be more about sending somebody out and sending a message than than necessarily who you bring back. Who's the guy to send out then, if that's the case? Well, so I think that's an interesting conversation that could be had. Yeah. I mean, the uh, the the not the obvious person, but the person that seems the most you know, least necessary is maybe Alexander yeah. Wenberg. That's uh, the name I zeroed in on. Yeah. But who's he? Look, he's not playing well right now. Really? Uh, I don't know who would want him. He's on an expiring deal too. Like, I don't know that there's a team out there needing a rental center that would really give you much for him. Now, if you really traded him for kind of next to nothing, that's certainly sending a message. And I think you could yeah. afford to move a center because Shane Wright just looked as good as he did. Yeah, that's that's the key is, yeah, maybe you, you've, <laughs> it is time for the youth and, and Shane Wright comes up and you can afford to move a center and everyone just kind of moves up one. Yeah, Wenberg would be the answer for me. Also, because with the expiring deal, too, if you really needed to, I know not a lot of teams, maybe at four and a half mil, but he does bring some useful elements. And if you you could you could potentially retain half. Yeah, like you, you don't have a you are not using your retention slots like this is something that you have available to you. You know, the actual money and cap hit isn't going to be a problem, especially if you're not really bringing a, a big contract back. Um, that should be fine for you. And, and at two point two five mil, I, I think there are some contenders that should maybe yes. want to bring in a player like him to be their third line center, yep. which is probably what he should be. I think that's actually an attractive asset at that point. So that's the way I would go. Um, I mean, you know, you do have the, the modified no trade clause to deal with. He does have a 10 team, no trade list. You can probably work around that. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the only other one I, I could see is potentially, and I hate to say this like Jordan Eberle, just cause he's the only other guy with an expiring contract and you know, the Yamamoto's on that line, you know, with Matty Beniers and looking pretty good. And, you know, maybe that's kind of a spot that you could have filled, but the, the leadership I, I would hate to get rid of, especially in a time like this. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, Wenberg would probably... I guess I mean that that seems like kind of the obvious guy if you are going to make a move. Yeah, it's tough, right? Bjorkstrand's one of the few guys on this team that is performing. McCann, you, he's he, you can't get rid of McCann. Uh, yeah, Schwartz is on fire and and is you know kind of does things that only he does. And Berkey probably has zero trade value just because he's been injured so much. Like why why would anybody trade for him? So um, yeah, you're you're kind of in a spot where you're looking at Wenberg, Everly, or Yanni. And I really think if the solution is right now, you're struggling with motivation and energy and effort level. Yanni's not the guy to move in that scenario. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, he's he's done what he can to try and get the team going at various points. Like he's still been the pepper pot and everything. You know, I think he's certainly not the problem. And and I think also, you know, there's the there's the talk of like the that there's the guys who get you there and the guys who get you through talking about yep. the playoffs. Right. We, we, what was the title of our podcast like weeks ago or the crack and two built for the yeah. playoffs. You could make the argument. They have too many guys who get you through, not enough guys who get you there. And I think Wenberg is absolutely one of those guys who get you through. And they, you know, those guys have value, but absolutely. right now I think you might need some more ice time going to guys who get you there. Exactly. So I, I think that's an option that the crack and need to start exploring. Um, I, I'm probably a little sooner on that than you are, but we'll, we'll find out. Right. And look, the, the next, four days will tell us a lot because you got another three games in that four day stretch which is insane rj i mean i it's they have so they're playing so many games right now i know I, yeah and i every time i check the standings it feels like the kraken have the most games played in the league and yeah i mean you know from our schedule and just covering all these games it feels like a real big crunch in the month of november just poorly timed with all these games coming up but yeah i suppose you know, 15th, 16th and 18th. I, that's, that's the only reason I say, just give it a little bit of time because especially if you're making a move like, you know, tomorrow or the next day, like in the middle of a back-to-back, -back, 
that's probably just not good for anybody. And I don't think that necessarily helps you with the spark you want right there. I think you just need at least a little time. Give it till after these back to backs and see what happens. And mm-hmm. then at that point, if it goes poorly, then, you know, all bets are off and, and maybe look to make a trade. Yeah. Glad you mentioned the back to back because I know Kraken practice today was canceled and that was kind of a thing on Twitter. Um, look, you got back to back games with travel in there. Like that's a home and road game in Edmonton kind of like you're going to Edmonton tomorrow and then you're coming back home against the Islanders. So there's travel on top of the back-to-back nights. Um, I I don't really know any team that would practice today to be perfectly honest, coming off a game and then going into that scenario, RJ, I don't think this is, you know, that curious from the Kraken. Yeah. Canceling practice makes all the sense in the world today, especially because the response after the last Edmonton game was to hold the practice. You normally wouldn't and, really work the guys yell at the guys make sure that message is sent and you can see the results against colorado so i don't know why you'd go back to the same thing that just didn't work for you two days ago and risk the guys being really tired for a back-to-back against edmonton and new york i don't think there's anything we can read into this that they've they've canceled practice it just it's what i would do if i was dave haxtell Mm -hmm. i think you agree um it just makes all the sense in the world so don't read too much into that um it's yeah, it's kind of clear that they were going to do that. And and remember, everybody, just because you're not at practice does not mean that these guys are not all together and that Hackstall cannot be talking to them and doing whatever, right? That's a plane ride to Edmonton. I don't know. If, how long is that? Maybe a two-hour plane ride? Uh, up a to, little bit longer. Maybe, yeah, two and a half up to Edmonton. You're going to have a morning skate tomorrow. You're on the road, so everybody's really kind of all in and around each other. There's plenty and plenty of opportunities for Hackstall to still get messages across to this team without, you know, making them bag skate uh, in the middle of, uh, you know, four games in six days stretch. (laughs) It's probably not the best (laughs) idea, to be perfectly honest. (laughs) Um, All right. Uh, I mean, we, we basically covered everything, RJ. We're at the hour mark. The only thing really left to talk about would be the home and road record. Right. The, the mm-hmm. fact that the, the, the continued struggles at home for the Kraken, you look at them on the road, they're three, three and three at home. They're two and five. This is another thing that's kind of weighing on season ticket holders. It's something that's got to be weighing on the team as well. I brought it up yesterday. If you're the Kraken at some point, do you just try to shake things up? Do you have that honest conversation with the guys of, look, what about being here is causing us problems and how do we address it? Um, or is this just kind of just an odd fluke thing to you? It's been long enough that I think maybe you have to have that conversation. And there's a downside to it, too, because as we mentioned on the post game after the last game, like you don't want the players thinking about this necessarily. Certainly not from the aspect of there's pressure because the season ticket holder, you know, the three-year plans expire. Don't go that far. It's literally just we need points, we need wins, and and half of our games are at home, and we need to start winning those. Is there something about our routine that we could change up? But it's certainly something that I think is, you know, from from the ownership to the front office on down is is something in present in people's minds is knowing that, yeah, there's this pressure because the three-year season ticket plans expire, and there are a lot of disgruntled season ticket holders. And I think for good reason, given the result that they have seen on the ice when you go to those games given the the lower ticket prices that they're seeing for resale there that they're paying higher than for similar seats you know I, I think it makes sense and i know there are a good number of season ticket holders probably listening to this podcast listening to us talk right now about this and like we understand your frustration it is absolutely valid um and it's something that i think the team is well aware of um but yeah the the home the home record is an issue and also but, but talking to them, at least asking them, because we've asked them all the way back to last season. It was more in terms of why are you so good on the road last year versus why are you so bad yeah. at home? But I can tell you from asking multiple players multiple times, from asking Dave Haxtell multiple times, including two days ago, nobody has an, an answer as to like why this is. Yeah. And, you know, maybe there's some deeper soul searching going on, but at least publicly, Nobody has any clue. I don't have any clue. I don't I don't know why they're so much worse at home. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I've got nothing on this as far as an actual answer. But maybe this is, you know, maybe they need to do some digging because it seems like, you know, they don't want to think about it a whole lot. And I get that because it's just one of those. It feels like one of those media narratives, right, that you, you just pull out like, oh, they suck at home. They should start, you know, staying at hotels or whatever. But after a certain point, 
you know, with these kind of results, maybe you have to start asking those questions. Like, again, it's, it's a very clickbaity type narrative, which I always yes. try and resist going into. I know into. you do. I know. And so it, it, that's thing, it, it kills me to, to admit this, but I think you might have to start asking those questions. Uh, so I looked it up. They were six games below 500 at home year one. Uh, a okay. year in which they were really below 500 overall. So that's actually kind of impressive. I'm looking at it now last year. They actually had a winning record at home. They were 2017 and four at home. It was just that, yes, that road record was so insane that it felt like they weren't very good at home. Um, and then this year so far, like I said, I mean, you're, you're two and five at home. You're three games back from 500 at home puts you on pace to be about 18 games below 500 at home for the year maybe if i did the math yeah. right which is certainly questionable that is a problem and i only brought it up because we are starting to have people legit say in the you know in in post game lives and stuff that hey this is why i'm not looking at renewing like that's it is a problem you're going to spend as much as they're asking you to spend you want to see the team win and, and also the other element with the home record, too, and I think it's worth mentioning is the loser point, because you pointed out their rec home record last season. Yes, it's above NHL 500, but they lost more games at home than they won. That is true. And, you know, you ask fans who go to the game and if you lose in overtime or a shootout, you're not feeling any better about that game than if the team lost in regulation. You're not being like, well, at least we got the loser point. You went to a hockey game. You wanted to see your team win and they didn't win. So I think that's, that's another part of it as well. And especially, you know, it can even have a bigger effect too, when you're in a dramatic overtime type game or, or shootout type situation, when you watch a team, you know, lose in that way, it can be even more frustrating. Yep. It can be. Um, I guess the one other note that I'm looking at right now, RJ, is actually the Kraken, and this is this is part of it too, and I'll, can be the, the topic maybe next week. We'll see how they do in the many games that they have left this week. Negative 18 goal differential, second worst in the NHL. Now, you're, you're well behind the Sharks, who are at negative 49 somehow already, <laughs> but uh, that's, you know, maybe that's something. And I know the Kraken have played 16 games. I'm looking, I I don't think anybody else has played that many games. So, you know, an accounting stat, that's, that's something, but you know, that's, it's not good to have a, a negative goal differential. That's already second worst in the league this close, you know, this far into November probably. Yeah, that is one of those well. underlying things that can kind of give you an indication of, okay, how good or bad is a team really? And yeah, second worst in the league. That's, even though you, yeah, you played more games than anybody else. Why? Um, yes. <laughs> it's still not good. Yeah. So there you go, everybody. That's, I mean, there's, there's lots of stuff we're going to, we're going to, we have to wait and see. It's not like we're in a position to do anything. Actually. I don't know why I would say anything other than we'll wait and see what happens. Um, <laughs> it's not like we can't do anything, uh, but we will wait and see. They got two games coming up back to back nights, including that live game commentary against Edmonton tomorrow. We can all really be in there. I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts about all the stuff that we talked about, especially while that game's going on. And there's always something that ends up happening during the game, aren't you, that we get into during the intermissions and stuff as well, whether it's how the elevators inside the St. Louis Arch works, or it's about what what is Morgan Geeky, what was he eating on the on the bench, right? There's there's always some fun stuff that develops from those things and that we get to get into with the community, and I love it. And then of course the big big news, which is that second Queen Anne Beer Hall location opening up December thirteenth. Uh, out there. I mean, that is some really exciting stuff. Remind everybody where it is, RJ. Yep, it's uh, at the Marina Park in Kirkland. So if you're on the east side, nice and easy to get to. Uh, that is the Moss Bay Hall location. So opening December 13th. Make sure to check that out next month. Awesome, awesome stuff. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this as always. And we will see you all next time. Hey everyone, before we go, we just wanted to give a quick shout out to all of our awesome patrons over at patreon.com slash emeraldcityhockey, especially our Terror of the Deep patrons. Absurdly Sane, Alex, Andrew, Anonymous, Beef, Ben, Brad, Brian, Burnt Creme, Kaylin, Chazzle Dazzle, Chris, Christian, Cody, Connor, Coop, DJ Singletone, Duthin, Eli, Elizabeth, Ethan, Evan, Gaby, Gary, Gregory, Harry Legionary, Habak, Jay, Jane, Joni, Joseph, Josh, Joshua, Justin, Katie, Keegan, Kepler, Kitty B. Kraken, Leanne, Light, Lonnie, Maeve, 
Mark, Max, Maya, Michelle, Nick, Noah, Nunya, Paige, Paul, Rayan, Rebecca, Ryan, Sarah, Scott, Sia Kraken, Sean B, Sean O, Sergey, Sergeant Pickles, Shannon, Shoeshine, Skeletal Tendency, Steve, Steven, Striatic, Tasty Kobold, Ty, Wendy, where are the Slovakians at? Strife and Zame. Thank you so much for making all this possible. We really appreciate your support. 